Dad left. Mom was an alcoholic. God, looking back, my childhood was depressing. Maybe not as depressing as some others. I wasn't molested, beside my uncle taking a photo of me in the shower once when I was seven. That was weird. I wasn't chained to a radiator. I wasn't starved. I wasn't frequently abused. Negotiable. But my dad left when I was two. My sister, who bullied me relentlessly when I was younger, who'd punch me on the bus and let middle schoolers drop books on my head when I was in kindergarten. We lived with my grandmother in a house that was, to say the least, a mess. Let's get this clear. We weren't hoarders. But a diagnosed ADHD five-year-old, me, an alcoholic, a bipolar grandmother in her 70s, and a moody teenager were not. That's an understatement. Good at cleaning house. The house was big and would have been beautiful if well-kept. It wasn't. It smelt. There was usually trash everywhere. Playdates at my house were a no-go. Elementary school was lonely. God, it was so lonely. I had maybe two true friends, one at school and a neighbor whose house I'd visit frequently. I was the freak, the spaz, the girl who talked too much, the girl who was separated from the other kids and told by teachers, you're just too stupid for this. Okay, to be fair, I was pretty horrible, I guess, but I had bad influences. Middle schoolers would curse around me, at me, on the bus. You know what I did one day in the lunch line because I was mad? I turned around and gave a girl the finger. A teacher saw and thought I was doing it to them. There was also another time where I had pushed someone for cutting me in line, and the next thing I knew, the girl was on the ground clutching her neck. Everyone claimed I choked her. I didn't. I was bullied for having a pink book bag, because femininity was such a horrible thing. My sister had joined in on the bullying. I remember swinging my book bag around and throwing it. Apparently, it hit this girl in my grade. I don't remember that. I relied on Barbies, stuffed animals, and imaginary friends for company. And I didn't see anything wrong with that. Why should I? Because they were real, right? Those adventures I went on with them happened, and of course they would never leave me. I spent a large portion of my childhood in my room. Or rooms, because at my house we switched rooms a lot. I remember hearing my mom yelling at grandma and going into my room and moving my bed to block the door. I remember the tiny TV and the DVD player I had, and I remember turning on Jurassic Park because to a first grader at the time, that was real. Dinosaurs were alive. They were here. Dr. Alan Grant and Ian Malcolm were actual people, goddammit, and maybe they would take me to go see the dinosaurs. Then the kids at school told me that Jurassic Park was fictional and dinosaurs had not indeed been brought back to life, and I didn't believe them until second grade. I used to think my dad was Ian Malcolm because Jeff Goldblum looked like how I remembered my dad. I loved my mom so much back then because I didn't realize anything was wrong with her. Just to avoid her when she started yelling, I held no personal grudges against her. It wasn't always Jurassic Park, all three movies. Sometimes it was Barbie or Land Before Time. At one point, it was The Hunger Games. I had a bow and arrow made of bamboo. My neighbor friend made it for me. They had bamboo trees growing in their backyard. God, at that time, that was so cool. Pretending to be Katniss Everdeen, that was a euphoric feeling. I was seven when I realized my sister genuinely wasn't afraid to hurt me. I remember walking home from the bus stop one day with her and stopping to tie my shoe. I don't tie my shoes anymore, not because of that. Maybe because of that? They get knotted and it's annoying. People tell me to tie my shoes constantly. I don't. She started walking, realized I stopped, grabbed my hair, and pulled me across the street. Then she gave me a black eye to prove to the other middle schoolers that she was cool. I remember ignoring my mom's drunk yells and her calling for me downstairs. No, why would I be able to hear her over the dinosaur roaring in my room? Why should I put down my Barbies for her? I was seven when I went to Seattle for the first time. I was even more lonely, honestly, because my dad, different dad than my sister, worked outside the baseball stadium selling magazines, and I would sit on the steps and wait for a shift to be over. But what was I really doing? God, I was exploring. I'd go off and talk to imaginary friends, and the one that would land outside the stadium in her own private jet. She was imaginary, so she could do that. I roamed down the apartment building halls, calling the fire escapes with my imaginary friends' apartments. I didn't even realize I was lonely. I love my dad. I do. He's tried his best and I'm so happy he's in my life now. 
even though he still lives in Seattle and I see him maybe a month out of the year now, if even. But Seattle was lonely. My uncle who lived with my dad wasn't a good man. He took advantage of my dad's hospitality. He made lewd comments. He took a photo of me while I was showering and called it a joke. I was eight when my aunt on my mom's side made me start stacking wood for her. Oh God, I hated stacking wood. I hated that her house with her and my extreme Christian right-wing uncle made me and my sister go over there and stack wood. I hated that stacking wood for the stupid fire pit and the stupid fireplace was where I would spend my summer before and after going to Seattle. I hated doing that in the heat. I hated doing that in the cold. And if we didn't do it right, we'd be up all night and wouldn't be allowed dinner until we finished. I hated stacking wood. I was nine when I realized my mother had a problem with alcohol. She started drinking that funny tasting and smelling substance and got really weird. And then she started yelling. But that was okay because I'd go to my room and watch Jurassic Park and play with my Barbies, right? I remember her threatening my grandma, threatening my sister, threatening me. Then I stole her phone and barricaded myself in the bathroom because that was the only room in the house with the lock. I remember the first time I called the cops on my mother. They came and they couldn't really do anything. They told her if they had to come back, she'd be arrested. I was so scared, I called my aunt and she came and picked us up. As much as I resented, I had have towards them for, you know, child labor and a bit of child abuse for different reasons than stacking wood. It was better than staying with my mother. Most of the time, grandma would come with. Sometimes she refused to be kicked out of her own house. We had bed bugs. That was an understatement. God, when I had brought bed bugs down from Seattle when I came back, we had them bad. It was horrible. We had to tear up our carpet, had to throw away our furniture. Me, my sister, and my grandmother slept on air mattresses and old chairs that my aunt had given to us. Keep them, she said. You see, my issue at the time wasn't the bed bugs. Personally, that was the least of my problems. A few months prior to the start of the bed bug ordeal, my best friend at school, my only friend at school, introduced me to that stupid internet meme, Slender Man. Me in third grade didn't really think of it as a meme. Nine-year-old me was convinced he was real and there was no doubt about that. I couldn't sleep. I prayed every night with my grandmother. I didn't pray before that. I don't pray now. Because that tall, thin man with tentacle arms was coming to get me. My mom had a boyfriend and was going back to college. She was calming down on her drinking. I had spent most of my time at her boyfriend's house with her since she had basically moved in with him. Those were some happy memories. He was a good cook, had a nice backyard in which I could shoot at the ground with my new plastic bow and arrow. The only time I was ever at home was on Wednesdays when my mom had a late class. And then, then my mom got arrested. She called into her school drunk because she had not finished a paper that was due the next day and claimed my brother was going to bomb the school. She doesn't have a brother, three sisters, two of which I've never met, no brother. It was a week after the Boston Marathon bombing. I didn't go to Seattle that summer. She spent a month in jail. I spent the last of the school year at my own house, going to my aunt's on the weekends. Then when summer came around, we practically lived at my aunt's house. I got a scholarship offer for a Girl Scout camp. I didn't take it because my impending fear of Slenderman had not faded away yet. I went from praying every night with my grandma to praying with my aunt. I remember visiting mom in jail. I remember crying. I remember my aunt taking us for ice cream afterward to cheer us up. Maybe my aunt wasn't all that bad, just my uncle. Mom got out. I got a 3DS for my 10th birthday. It was midnight blue. God, I remember how much time I spent on that. My sister threw a hissy fit over me getting one and she had one a week later. Mom got drunk the night of my birthday. We still had no permanent furniture. That was an issue. We got some, not all of it at once. I was only on my air mattress in a different room playing a game. Mom was drinking. She yelled at me and dragged me into the living room claiming she wanted me to be with family. My 10th birthday tied worst birthday ever with my 9th. I fell off a swing in Seattle and broke my arm. Fourth grade, mom went to rehab. She took me with her as there was a special program where you could bring your children along. 
I was the only fourth grader there, besides the babies whose mothers didn't have anyone who could watch them. That was during the time where I really started liking books. I was reading The Hunger Games, they took my DS, and I had nothing better to do. My imaginary friend had long faded away, and my interest in Barbies disappeared. My only real companion was the stuffed T-Rex I had taken with me. Mom got kicked out of rehab within two weeks. She broke a rule. Talked to someone while she was being shunned. She called them crazy. I lived with my Nana, Dad's side, for two weeks. I missed school. I finished the first and second Hunger Games book in those two weeks. Then I found out that I was being sent off to Seattle to live with my dad. I was going to finish fourth grade up there. As a reward for finishing the entire Hunger Games series, my mom had given me a tablet. It was an Android off-brand of something, but I didn't care because I had a tablet. I read online, I wrote, I started realizing that I really liked writing. I had friends up there. I grew even more passionate about reading and writing. I loved going to my library because of books, but also because of the Wi-Fi that my dad didn't have at the time with my dad. Then my tablet got stolen. I left it next to my book bag while I went to the bathroom. My dad bought me another one. He surprised me with it. I came back six months later, my mom telling me I would be going to a different school. My old school knew about my mom's drinking problem. She didn't like that. I lost contact with all the friends I had made in basically my lifetime up to that point. The neighborhood friend had to move. I lost touch with the Seattle kids. Fifth grade was back to being incredibly lonely. My Nana died. It was her last Christmas. It was devastating. In sixth, I had one true friend and she left school and I never saw her again. No one wanted to be friends with the tall, big girl who was called King Kong. Not until seventh grade is when I realized I had a few people that liked me. But I had books. I had those stupid Jurassic Park movies and I finally had a phone. I'm a sophomore in high school now and I don't rely on books or Jurassic Park or imaginary friends or Barbies for company now because I have friends. Mom still drinks and my sister is still, in all terms I could think of, a bitch. Dad still lives in Seattle. He was here for Christmas. I didn't sleep well. I grew up lonely. I didn't realize it at the time because, well, who was I to doubt my imagination? But I was painfully alone. So alone that I relied on extensions of my imagination for company. Because the teacher said, this girl is too wild to be with kids her age. She shouldn't talk. Because my mom was so drunk off her ass, I isolated myself without even realizing I was isolated. Refusing to cook the kind of food my husband. So let me preface this by saying that I was overweight when I met my husband. Also, before I started working from home, I, a female of 28, didn't really care about how healthy our meals were. I cooked comfort food most of the time with little thought regarding calories, and my husband, a male who's 41, loved everything I made. I think it's part of the reason he fell for me, to be honest. Since I started working from home, I now have an extra two hours a day as I'm no longer commuting and have used it to start exercising. My family has a history of high blood pressure and it hit home for me just recently that it's time to get in shape. My husband was supportive at first, but as I've started to really lose weight, he's become less so. He's always bringing home junk food, which would be fine if he wanted it just for himself, but he tries to pressure me into eating it as well. My husband is a mailman and walks 15 miles a day, so he's in better shape than I am. His dinners used to consist of two or three helpings of whatever unhealthy food I made that day. Lately, I've been making healthier choices when it comes to our food. My husband can't cook to save his life, and the grocery shopping and all cooking is done by me. When I say healthier choices, I don't mean tofu and kale. I mean that I've started cooking our favorite foods, but with healthier alternatives like using 1% milk instead of heavy cream and adding veggies. Since I've started doing this, my husband has doubled his efforts in trying to get me to stop working on my health. He still has his normal two to three helpings, so the food can't taste that bad. It's gotten to the point where I don't even share with him anymore if I reach a new goal because he gets all surly. It all came to a head last night when I made a casserole and added broccoli and used a lighter sauce. 
he flipped out and said, I'm trying to push my get better looking agenda off on him, even though my efforts to get in shape have nothing to do with how I look. He then accused me of being sick of him and using my workouts as an excuse to get away from him, which is completely untrue. I enjoy our time together, and my workouts right now are only 40 minutes because it's all I can manage, so I'm not leaving him alone that long. He then said that he would drop it if I would go back to cooking and eating the way I used to. I told him that he was more than welcome to cook the way he wanted, but he refused and left in a huff. While he was gone, I called my sister to try to get some perspective. She sided with my husband and said I was being TA by not providing him with the fuel he needs for his physically intensive job, even though the cooking I'm making now is more nutrient dense than it was before. And that just because cooking was one of my tasks in the relationship didn't mean I should be the only one with any say in how things are made. I'm a 19-year-old female. My 22-year-old boyfriend does not want me being friends with my guy friends. I'm a tomboy girl who plays a lot of video games and has a tendency to get along better with guys because of this and of my more laid-back personality. I have a really, really hard time making friends that are girls. Most of the friends I did have would lie and backstab and spread secrets about me, and 9 times out of 10, I would have a big falling out because I would eventually get mad or upset and not be able to take it anymore, and everyone would end up hating me and shunning me from the group of girls. So I have a hard time trusting girls because of this. My friend group consisted of me, another girl, and three guys. My friend who is a girl, we will call her Amy, I have known since high school. She introduced me to one of the guys who in turn introduced me and Amy to the rest of the group. My boyfriend and I have been together for about 10 months now. Since the beginning, he has known I have close guy friends. In the beginning, he put on the front that he was okay with this, but gradually became more expressive about how this bothered him and upset him. Out of the group, I was closest with Amy and one of the guys, we will call Kevin, and I talked to the both of them regularly through texting. Kevin has helped me through a lot and has talked me through more problems than I could think of. To me, it was important that my boyfriend met Amy and Kevin because they were two of the most important people in my life at the time. When Kevin was scheduled to take leave, my boyfriend absolutely refused to meet him, told me he would never like him and that he would never be okay with our friendship. His reasoning was that guys and girls can never just be platonically friends. I even tried to explain how Kevin had feelings for Amy and everything to try and show him Kevin was not interested in me. After a while, I began to feel guilty and beat myself up over having guy friends, and eventually began nitpicking the things I didn't like in a way to convince myself to not be their friend. At the end, I didn't reach out to them as much, and they hardly, if ever, reached out to me. Fast forward to a couple months later, and I am working at this new job and trying to make friends. I'm still in touch with Amy, though not very close since she is opinionated and I often do not agree with her opinions, which in turn causes her to get mad at me. I'm pretty much seeking out girls at this point to be friends with because I do genuinely want friends that are girls so they could relate with me to the things my guy friends couldn't, but also because I know it wouldn't put a strain on my relationship. Where I work, not many girls work there, so I tried to make friends with who I could and lo and behold, they are all guys. It makes me hate myself because I feel terrible for only being friends with guys and I know it drives my boyfriend crazy and I want nothing more than for him to be happy, but I just cannot have friends. I ended up becoming close to a guy we will call Dale, and now he has become practically my only friend and the only person I really talk to other than my boyfriend. Well, my boyfriend tried to put on the front that he was okay with it and he was going to meet him, but the day before he met him, my boyfriend got upset and told me he didn't like it. I tried my best to comfort him, explaining how I only have eyes for him and that I will never be friends with the guy if I genuinely thought they would be disrespectful towards my relationship. But in the end, I basically agreed to not talk to him anymore, or at least as much. Well, this weekend, my boyfriend had a plan to go hang out with his friends for the weekend about an hour away, and usually it's just him and two other guys, but now it's his normal two friends and two more guys he usually doesn't hang out with. 
They like to drink and go to bars and clubs typically, but they can't do any of that because of the coronavirus. They also used to smoke weed together, but since my boyfriend has quit, just his friends do it even when he's there. I have never been a big drinker or partier and have been in bad situations where people force drinking and weed on me. I don't mind drinking with my boyfriend to cut loose a little, but my boyfriend never wants to drink with me. This has made it all that much harder for me to accept him drinking with his friends because he just never will drink with me. It hurts my feelings and I've brought it up before, but he just seems to make excuses as to why he won't. I've never been comfortable with any of it, but I knew it made him happy, so I always supported him. Now that he's made it hard for me to be friends with the people I want to be friends with, I have a hard time supporting the things he wants to do that I don't like because I don't have his support. I expressed I was upset he was going and I have nothing to do or no one to talk to because he had a problem with my friends. I got mad, I got sad, I got stressed, I cried, and he offered not to go, but I would never be the girlfriend who would ask him not to see his friends. He went to see his friends and now I feel so hurt and angry and resentful towards him for going because I know that if he had expressed how upset he was, he wouldn't have had to ask me not to go. I just wouldn't have. I texted him explaining how I was mad and hurt and that I didn't know if I could speak to him right now. And all he said was he didn't know how upset I was even though I literally told him. I feel like he gets to do whatever he wants, but I can't do what makes me happy. I know he loves me and I love him very much, but I'm just hurt and confused. I don't want to make either of us unhappy, but I feel like either we both get what we want or neither of us get what we want will only be the solutions, but they really don't feel like solutions. I need help. How religion took 16 years from my life. It feels weird to do this, but I wanted to tell my story to people who might understand. I'm not professionally diagnosed, but I definitely have deep emotional and mental problems. Please don't tell me to seek out professional help. I want to have therapy so bad. I know that I need help, but for now, it's not possible because if I would ask my parents, they would tell me I should pray to God and he would fix the phase I have. But I assure you, as soon as I get the opportunity to seek out professional help, without my parents knowing I'm going to. As long as that is possible, I'm trying to figure out what is going on with me on my own. I did so much research during quarantine because I started to question my sense of self, especially my identity, and ended up having an internal crisis. I thought my issues weren't that deep because I never was physically abused and technically everything in my life was fine. I had clothes, food, and an overall loving family on the surface, and I played it down because I thought someone like me can't call their experiences trauma because I was never hit nor bullied. Generally, people like me because I was a massive people pleaser and still do it, but it's gotten better. Or at least, they were nice to me. My parents supported me, helped me out when I needed money for something. And now there are two parts of me fighting. The one part that knows exactly how hecked up I really am, and the other part that tells me I'm exaggerating, that I should stop overthinking and stop being ungrateful. I'm torn, and I hope to find at least one person who kind of understands me. I feel like no one could ever get me, because my trauma doesn't feel validated. Even though I found out that the part of the brain that is responsible for physical pain is also responsible for emotional pain. It still feels like I don't deserve to be heard because on the surface, everything was perfectly fine. And even though I talked to friends about it and they really helped me, they still told me to be grateful that I was well-liked and no one directly hurt me. But I can't. I can't look at the positive aspects and live normally. It affects my life. It affects the person I am. It shaped me. I can't concentrate and it got worse and worse with time. I have emotional outbursts that I learn to hide. I'm constantly on guard and don't feel safe in my house because I constantly think my parents could find out something that I'm hiding from them. I can never relax no matter where I am, except when I'm at my boyfriend's house and I know no one is going to be at home for a longer period of time. I feel like I'm not worth it. I feel ugly on the inside and outside and I hate myself for coping by overeating. 
I'm not a beast nor anything near it, but if I continue to eat how I eat without going to the gym, it could happen. I feel like I don't have to be the main mother figure to my sisters because my mom is so emotionally detached that I don't want them to think that what she does is real love. But the worst thing is how distant I feel from my emotions and myself. Does a myself even exist? Can I ever be it? I feel numbed out and drained, even though I do nothing all day but distract myself as good as I can. I feel like I never achieved anything and that I never will. Everything is so overwhelming and so hard to do, even the littlest homework or task. That's why I have a pile of work in my emails and in the back of my mind that stresses me the hell out. But I just can't get myself to do it unless it has a deadline. And even then, I tend to it last minute. I feel weak, stupid, and misunderstood, and I think to myself, if that continues, all my good marks are going to drop, and then my parents are going to be a problem even on the surface. I'm doing my A-levels, class of 2021, in Germany, I was born here, right now, and I just feel like I can't do it, and it is required from me that I get a prestigious degree, even though I would rather pursue a singing career. That was the longest introduction I ever wrote, but it needed to be at least written down somewhere. So what is the big deal? What am I complaining about? I'll try to create a chronological order and to remember everything crucial, but I yesterday realized that I'm mixing blocks of time in my memories, even from recent times. It all started before I was born. My parents found each other through friends and got together. My mom lived in Kazakhstan before moving to Germany. I still don't know exactly know why. And my father lived in Siberia before moving to Germany. His and my uncle's parents wanted to prevent them from having to fight in a war zone. And so they happened to live in the same city and they met. They got together and married. Then their neighbors invited them to go with them to a Russian German evangelical church and they ended up being members. Then I was born and everything was perfect. I was in church every Sunday from the moment my mother could leave the hospital. I never knew anything different. And as soon as I was able to be separated from my mother for two to three hours, I was with other children my age while the adults were attending the big service. And then the indoctrination started. I don't remember much from my time in church, or the cult as I call it now, from the time before I was 12. I only remember my time in school, which is very odd to me but what do I know? I just remember being a people pleaser from the start and everything they taught us, but there aren't many clear memories. I was good at being a people pleaser. Now it's easy for me to approach people and connect on a surface level, but at what price? It's scary to me that my memories are so blurry. I don't even know who I was friends with or if I even had friends before the age of 10. I just remember that I wanted to be perfect in God's eyes. I wanted to be the perfect example of a girl who loves Jesus with all her heart. I wanted people in church to look at me and think I will make it far in my faith. And I achieved that, I think. But now I hate my past self for caring so much. So what were we taught there? God created the world, Jesus died for my sins and resurrected after three days. The Bible is the only truth and the only way I must live. Everything else is the devil's work. And even though they didn't say it in particular, but that our church is the only one to teach the real truth and that every other church doesn't have God in it and immediately leads to hell and damnation. We were taught that the secular world was highly dangerous. And as soon as we were not following one of God's, the church's, rules, we were open for demons to attack us. And to make it short, you could sin by thinking something. So we were taught to somehow control our thoughts but give full control to God over every little aspect in our lives because everything is predestined and we don't have control about anything anyways. But we're still responsible for our actions somehow and we still have a free will granted from God. While writing this, I really understand how contradicting this is and it was a core belief of mine. When an adult who looked after you as a toddler tells you this and there are 500 people who all believed it wholeheartedly, You try to justify it until you really can't anymore. And then everything shatters. Losing faith is something that was so deeply intertwined with your whole existence. It's like part of you just died. Even though you know how ridiculous it was believing in it, 
and you still feel stupid for not realizing it earlier. So in a nutshell, everything bad you do is because you're not saved. Because for someone who is really saved, it's physically impossible to sin no matter how. And automatically, fully your fault. But when you achieve something, it's because God did it. You're never capable of doing or achieving something on your own. You're even unable to think the right, good way. So you're basically nothing and unimportant. But when you come to God, he gives you a purpose he specifically chose for you. You matter to him. You're worthy of his love. And even though we were taught he is forgiving to everyone and almost everything, if you only follow him everywhere he leads you. Another bizarre contradiction they teach little children, you're nothing but with God, you're worthy. It makes me unbelievably mad that there are gradually more and more children who grow up believing this, who are taught that demons, the devil, and hell are around every corner to take them and torture them for eternity if they slip up one tiny bit. That's why I cried myself to sleep for years begging God to forgive me for saying shit one time or thinking in my head that I wanted to kiss a boy, not speaking of being attracted to a girl. Because of course, anything than straight marriage within my church is wrong. Yes, I was expected to have a boyfriend within church. And if he was in the world, I had to convince him to go to church and he has to love God. We weren't allowed to date before 17. And of course, no premarital sex, but they took it further to prevent it at all cost. You weren't allowed to be alone in a room with your significant other before marriage, so nothing could possibly happen. Holding hands and short hugs were allowed when engaged. So if you grew up there, find a boyfriend and get engaged as fast as possible, because if you fall in love, it must be in God's plan. Because you want to F and then marry as fast as possible, you have to be together at least a year and then be engaged for at least half a year to have your first kiss ever if you weren't sinful, in front of everybody, and when the pastor says, you may kiss the bride. We were taught that God wants us to be pure and learn to value our partner's personality. They told us girls that if we had a sexual relationship before marriage, you would never know if he really loves you or just wants your body, and that every guy outside church would never love us for our personalities. Another contradiction. These young adults rush into marriage not because they think, wow, I really value my partner as a person. No, they're sex-driven teenagers lying to themselves, which is absolutely not their fault, of course. No one is appreciating anything, and if they are, they're very lucky. Because there were maybe 15 people in your age range that you could end up with. Girls were also taught to save themselves because we are like chewing gum. And if you're all chewed up, your godly future husband wouldn't want you, would he? We were told we were pure glasses of water, and if we sleep around before marriage, or even with only one person, every time dirt would fall into our pure water, and no one wants to drink dirty water. But the one thing that stuck with me that my mother, and later on, more older woman, told me was every time you sleep with the man, he takes part of your soul with him. That's why there should be only one guy from the start, so that you don't end up losing your soul. The thought of that terrified me to the core, and I believed it. Now I know it's bullshit, but it was in my head constantly for five or six years. We were told to cover up so guys don't want sin with their eyes and thoughts. Knee-length skirts and shorts were allowed, and I always hated how they looked on me. And you had to cover your belly and your shoulders at all cost. Cleavage was obviously not allowed, and so weren't tight clothes. Only skinny jeans, not leggings especially when you had a little bit more chest. And if you dared to show a tiny bit of skin, no matter how hot summer was, even if it was accidental, you'd get in trouble. I was in that godforsaken building almost every day, except for Wednesdays where we would meet up with our local little group of girls. There was a leader a few years older than us, and I'm glad mine wasn't as controlling as others and didn't force me too much to work in different groups in church and discuss what our beloved... I could vomit remembering him and his sleazy and narcissistic behavior, pastor, taught us on Sunday. I was involved in worship, and my love for singing kind of saved me because that's the only thing I really did because I myself wanted it. I danced, which was okay. It was workout for me and not dancing for God when I think about it. 
I looked after toddlers once month during service with other women. I was in the theater group, and when there was an event for teenagers, I was responsible for leading a group of other teenagers to organize it, so everything was done and standing where it belongs. I liked organizing, so I was lucky they just positioned me there, but it was still hella stressful. And I played the piano, which I didn't really enjoy. So there were the basics. I was heavily involved. With 12, you move from being with children to the big service, and you're finally old enough to be part of all the cool things the teenagers did. But then you're also constantly stressed out, which worsened every year because obviously school got harder, but also the church demanded more and more, and suddenly you were thrown into highly responsible tasks, which drained you. When I was 14, I started constantly having headaches. I started drinking coffee because I was exhausted from not being able to sleep, being stressed out and constantly worried that someone would find out my secrets. And now I need a very strong one for it to work. Because in school, I was someone else. I had a different name in my school, my real name. In church, the pastor required my parents to introduce me with a very far away nickname from my real name because it sounded like a name in the Bible that an evil person had. And if I'd be called that, it would curse me. I did and said what I wanted. It increased gradually because I still tried to be myself, which you could be in church. No, in school, but obviously couldn't do that because no one can. I thought I was being myself in school and maybe that was myself when I was 14, but I still was the most severe case of a people pleaser. And I always ended up in dependent, toxic friendships because I could never say anything against them. I had no one else who was close to me, so that also hurt me even though I didn't notice at the time. People abused my kindness because in church they told us we had to be nice. And I could do that at least. So I held on to being nice to everyone, helping everyone, and inviting people to come to church who were remotely close to me, which still embarrasses me the most, but you get in trouble when you're not inviting people. I'm so glad I was in a very accepting class. No one was ever really bullied, just mocked for a few things maybe, which I was, for being in that church. And they told me early on, it's a cult, you believe in crazy shit, stop going there. But we were taught that people who were afraid of the truth always say that. School was kind of a safe place for me, even if I had toxic friendships and got hurt a few times, because we live about 25 kilometers away from church, the cult, and nobody I knew from there could see me. And even though we were taught that God could see everything and is always reading our thoughts, I didn't feel very watched. I was scared shitless when I wore something in school we weren't allowed to wear in church, and I thought I saw someone I knew, so I felt better in school than at home. And that's why my definition of home is something entirely different than that of people who grew up in an emotionally safe home. So what was living in my home like? I'm the first daughter of three, and therefore my father's precious firstborn. I learned really fast that just keeping quiet, smiling, and doing what I'm told is the best way to avoid any more stressful situations. I hated every form of confrontation, and I still do. When I was young as three, my father threatened to hit me with a belt, and did it a few times, but I stopped misbehaving or questioning, so no one yelled at me anymore, and no one told me to stand in a corner without looking. So I just learned to not show my emotions at all at home, because emotions cause trouble and distress. They also told us that. God in our own intellect, which is controlled by God, must lead us. Emotions come out because of the devil. My father was in control of everything, and to this day, he is still extremely sexist, racist, homophobic, transphobic, etc. You name it. And he still thinks I have exactly the same opinions as him. He is very critical of my boyfriend, but because he puts on a facade in front of my father as I do, my father likes him. My parents, more my father, still don't want me to have anything premarital, even though they are less strict than before. So yeah, I can't ask for birth control because then they would not let me see my boyfriend. As I said, my father is very controlling and has a very high opinion of himself. Because he is providing for our family, he doesn't have to do anything regarding the house. This is on the women and the four girls in the house because that's what God made us for. Popping out babies, cleaning, and cooking. But I still have to get a degree and a high paying job. And then I ask myself, what do you want from me? What? In church, we learn that you have to find a job that gives you enough time to be as active as possible in church, 
while giving birth to as many children as possible and managing your whole household completely alone because your husband is by God's law above you and there to lead you. How remarkably generous of you to lead me because I can't decide on anything ever due to always thinking I don't have control anyways. That's why I need to plan everything obsessively and always know and control what's going on. I idolize my father until the realization that we don't have any emotional bond slowly reached me until it hit me hard. I had to organize my phone a certain way and delete messages so in case he would want to go through it, he wouldn't find anything. He wanted me to be his perfect show daughter who has good marks and serves God with all of her existence, and he really did that. In front of him, I am what he wants me to be. I don't know what my mother wants. She just does what my father tells her and silently agrees to what he has to say. Maybe I learned to behave in that way because she did. I'm honestly sorry for her because she never had a chance to study anything that can make her independent because of moving to Germany at 17 or 18 and not being able to speak the language very well. I could cry because no matter how brutal this sounds, her life is over in a way. She is what I never want to be. Whenever they told us how our future will look like, I had a kind of panic that I never felt before. At the time, I suppressed that, but when I think back, my heart rate goes up and I feel like I need to run as fast as I can. And that's why I hate to be dependent on someone. But weirdly, I still end up in situations where I'm highly dependent. Another thing that I can maybe explain now is my reaction to my grandfather's death. He was more of a father to me than my own, and his and his wife's home which I also deeply love, felt safe. When I was 11 years old, my grandmother, my grandfather's wife, passed away because of cancer. And I was never allowed to see her while she was sick, nor to attend the funeral. And in that time, I already saw my grandpa rarely. When my parents told me my grandma passed away, I cried one time. I know that I was sad, but I somehow can't recall my immediate emotions from that day. And I thought I'm glad that I still have my grandpa, but he passed away three months later, and I wasn't able to see him during those months. When my father, emotionlessly, told us that his father also passed away, I felt nothing. I didn't cry, no reaction at all, and then I didn't think about it for years. But when I was 14, all of a sudden, all of the emotions I should have felt when I was 11 crushed me harder than ever. It was like reliving the day I was told he was gone forever for almost a year, and I was so confused. Why now? Why didn't I feel anything back then? Because my brain was already way too stressed for an 11 year old and just didn't process properly. Then three years later, something triggered my memories and the horrors began. When I was 16, it hit me again because I found out he committed suicide through my cousin. Back to the cult. So am I still there? No. My parents realized how manipulative literally everything about it was and without telling anyone there, Childhood friends I grew up with included, we went there one last time and on Sunday the 23rd of September 2018, we drove away and never came back. And many others left too. We still meet every Sunday and I still sing there because I don't want to confront my parents. I really don't want to be there because every time we're there, I'm not really there. I'm just a shell that moves around. During the preaching, which a few men do in turns, I'm always completely zoned out and can only concentrate for a bit if I really try. I don't know what that is or that means, but I absolutely hate it because I can't control it. And sometimes I'm just sad for no reason. I still can't sleep and still get a massive headache and can't stand up properly without strong coffee. I still eat too much stuff. I really shouldn't. And I feel bad for every little bit I eat, but I can't stop. And it also affects all of my relationships especially with my boyfriend. He sometimes doesn't understand, but he still comforts me and is patient, which I'm really grateful for. And something that comes to mind only now is that my father used to completely lose it when I had a bad mark. I was afraid to come home and always started crying before even telling him. And then he would shout even more, beat the table with his fist and tell me to stop crying. Now I can control if I'm gonna cry or not when something upsets me, and if I want to show my emotions or not. Being a very good liar was essential, and it still is. When my father is mad at me because I don't do the dishes, he still gets very impulsive and shames me because if he works and gives me food and clothing, it's disrespectful to leave the dishes for too long. 
And when he stands beside me and doesn't stop while I do the dishes, I just nod my head and say yes. It's the only way to avoid more pain at all cost. There are these moments, but also the ones where he tries to talk to me and ask how I am, and then he tells me how he loves me, his firstborn princess. He tells me that I'm the best daughter someone could have, and that he's so proud of me. And I just smile at him and say thank you. But on the inside, I think, if you really knew who I really am and what I did that you don't have, you wouldn't talk to me anymore. He is proud of the daughter he created for himself that I still am in front of him. And also my mother tries to get closer to me after 16 years of distance and letting the church raise us. And the only thing I would tell her if I was honest for a few seconds in the midst of all the lies I protect myself with, I'm sorry, but it's too late. I don't have any emotional connection to my parents and I never had. The first 16 years of my life were partly wasted. I felt like someone took my childhood from me. Even my memories are blurry. And I know it's technically not my parents' fault, but I want to blame them so badly. And it makes me so mad that I was born because of the church, because they convinced my father to have children. I was cursed before I even existed. And still, I can recall a few beautiful memories of things I did with my friends there. The sleepovers, summer camp, singing together, playing hide-and-seek in the big building. All of us connected through our fear of the dangerous outside world and hell. There is no moment in my life where I wasn't afraid that some adult could dream or feel. They taught us that God could reveal things about people to you when you have a strong connection to the Holy Spirit, that I was a dirty sinner that acted differently in school. And it was so frightening because when it's out that you messed up, you can't attend certain rituals like the Holy Communion, and that's when people know. They see that you're not taking part in it, and the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, premarital sex. When a couple did it, and someone found out, it made sure by the authorities that in a week, everyone knows. And I wanted to avoid people thinking that at all cost, so I was very aware and on guard at all the time. I made sure I had a different app also open while watching Vampire Diaries on my phone, because there you could switch faster so my mother or father, who still just burst into my room whenever they want to, would never know I would watch something the devil created. My parents and everyone in the church who was responsible for me always tried to shelter me and get anything with a bad influence away from me, but I still watched what I wasn't allowed to. The internet and myself raised me when my beliefs started to break away. People like Jenna Marble taught me things parents should teach their kids. I educated myself on so much stuff I missed out on and started to build my own opinions and morals from 14 to 16. Basic knowledge like it's okay to not believe what your parents believe was so new to me. And now I just want to move out and study something so I'm always safe. I can't wait for the day where I'm finally going to be financially independent and don't have to rely on my father. Wow, it feels so good to put that all in words. When you watch until now, you must be really, really bored. But thank you. I appreciate your attention greatly. 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 I was asked to a threesome, and I declined. I was 16 years old and was a swimming instructor at the local outdoor pool during the summer. My job, basically, was to teach little kids ages 6 to 10 how to float. It was a job where I had to do very little for getting some good cash, so like any teenager looking to make a quick buck, I jumped on it. I had a clock in time of 3.45pm to 6.15pm. Fairly bad time to be swimming in my opinion, because summers in India are brutal. But anyway, in those two and a half hours, me and another instructor had two classes of about 30 kids each. The pool had an adjoining deck where the parents could stand and watch their kids flap around in the water. In the second class, we had two kids who were pretty good swimmers, and I always wondered why they were in my class from the start of the summer. To clarify, the local pool place had two pools, a small one where kids who were starting out had to practice paddling and floating, and a full-size pool where the kids who were a little older and knew how to swim would practice. I, being a first-time instructor, was allocated the small pool for obvious reasons. Anyways, the kid who knew how to swim would be shifted to the big pool by their parents with the recommendation of instructors from my pool later in the summer. 
When I talked to my partner slash other instructor about these kids, he told me that they were in the bigger pool last year, but their moms got them shifted to the pool back this summer. Weird moms, I thought, but shrugged it off. For changing rooms, we instructors had a small outhouse kind of building, which barely had a shower and a loo, but no doors or curtains. The changing rooms also had small ventilators through which if someone wanted to, could see the person showering. Pretty sucky, but it was, after all, a small pool place. After two classes, both the instructors were off the clock, and the next set of instructors would come in for the last two classes of the day. Every day when I'd be stepping off the pool, I would talk to the kids' parents about the class and how their kids did, how they can improve, etc. I would make it a point to talk to every parent who wanted to have a word before going to the showers so that they could be on their way and I could take a shower in peace without making anybody wait for me. The mom of those two kids, however, were not interested in that. They would make it a point to wait every day for me to finish, come out of the showers, and then talk to me about anything except their kids. They gave their kids smartphones so that they wouldn't interrupt. It started getting weirder by the day, and I made it a point to keep recommending them to shift their kids to the bigger pool just so that they would get off my back. I couldn't just complain to my supervisor because it wasn't anything extreme, just a little weird. The moms were obviously not willing to listen that their kids ready for the big pool and that they were still learning to paddle and they needed my help. One day after my class, while I was showering, I could see these two moms snickering outside the outhouse and looking at me. They couldn't see the whole estate because we blocked off the walls of the ventilator, so you couldn't really stand next to the ventilator, but you could still see the face of the person showering. I was thoroughly grossed out and just wanted to go home. I didn't even bother to acknowledge them and just walked towards the parking lot. I was standing by my bike, putting on the helmet, when I felt a tap on the shoulder. And who would it be but one of the moms? Let's call them M1 and M2. M1. Hi, sir. How are you today? We wanted to talk to you about how our kids did today. Me. Disgusted look. They did fine. Like I said, they don't need to be in my pool. They could shift to the other one. M2. No, no, no. They still need you. Plus, it gives us a chance to look at you while you teach them. Me. What? M2. I mean, we could still see how good they are doing in the class. Me. Like I said, they are good swimmers now. They don't need me. Just wanting this weird conversation to be over. M1. Okay, okay. Actually, we were thinking if we could talk to you about something else, too. We really need help from you. Me. Look, ma'am, I'm just trying to go home, and I'm doing everything I need to for your kids. M1. No, no. We need you to help us moms. Me. Help you how? M1. We want you to teach us how to swim. We really want to learn and be able to swim with our little angels. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. I only teach kids. M2. Can't you make an exception for us? We'll make it worth your time. She starts to stroke my arm, and both of them take steps towards me, coming uncomfortably close. I realize exactly what she's implying. At this point, the parking lot was pretty empty because all the kids and their parents had left, and so had my partner. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. This isn't something that I'm interested in, and can you please not touch me? M1. Don't be ridiculous. We just wanted to learn swimming and do some other things with you. Me. Stop it, ma'am. Do you realize I'm 16 years old, and this is illegal, and you both would be charged as pedophiles? M2. Oh, come on. You don't look 16. You are lying. Do you really not want us? You always wait after class and talk to us alone. Me. Ma'am, that's my job. I'm supposed to do that. This is making me uncomfortable. If you both don't leave me alone, I'm going to complain to my supervisor and call the police on you. Both of them started squirming and took some steps back. I took the chance to start my bike and rushed away. As soon as I got home, I called my partner and told him exactly what happened. He told me to calm down and told me that we'll talk to the supervisor tomorrow. We never did talk to the supervisor because apparently after I left, both of the moms canceled their kids' membership and they never returned. I didn't really want to pursue the matter, just forget about it. Years after, the Chad in me still says that I could have had a threesome when I was 16 and I'm an idiot who passed it up. But at that time, I was pretty traumatized and didn't know what to make of the whole situation. Also, I'm pretty sure I'm missing out a few lines from the conversation, but I just don't remember quite a bit of it. This is all I remember. Anyways, thanks for reading if you did. And again, discount any mistakes that I might have made. Let me know what you think. My friends went missing when I was six. 
I guess to start off, I should introduce myself. My name is Melissa, I'm 16 years old, and around 10 years ago, four of my friends went missing. I remember the day clearly, yet some parts are all fuzzed up. It's strange how the mind works. Anyways, I was six. My dad, older brother Matthew, and younger brother Liam were driving to a birthday party. It was hosted at this old knockoff showbiz pizza place. We lived in a tiny town in Utah, so this was really the only place for kids to hang out. A cheap place for parents to drop off their demons to occupy them. My brother, who was 15 at the time, worked there as a waiter while my dad worked the day shift. When we were really little, my dad would sometimes let one of the managers babysit us, mostly me. I remember him well. He always wore plaid and flannel and almost was always working on something. There was another manager too, but he was very distant. He disliked kids despite having his own. He never talked much. I'm getting off topic. Anyways, the second we pulled into the semi-crowded lot of the pizza place, I hopped out. I threw the glass doors open and ran into the main show area. There was the big stage with bright multicolored lights showcasing three classic animatronic animals. There was confetti on the tiled floor and glitter on the tables. I was very quick to find my friend, the birthday boy. He had russet ginger hair and brown eyes. He was two years older than me, turning nine that day. I don't remember his name as my brain repressed this day so much, mostly him. We were close, I knew that. I probably just wanted to forget to ease the pain. I remember grabbing him into a hug and talking for a while as the other members of the party filled in. There were five of us in total. I remember the others, but not much. Only key features. The oldest, I believe, was a boy with dark brown hair, and he was tall. Like, really tall. I remember something strange with his eyes. They were cold, yet so warm and welcoming to us. The other boy, I think, was the opposite. He had long, messy, dark hair and was really short. I think his name started with a J. Jeremy or Jamie, maybe. I don't even remember if he was a girl or a boy. There was a girl, though. I remember her well. She has honey blonde hair and I think green or blue eyes. She was hyper and sweet. I think she called me Melly Bear. I do know she had a puppy, a little yellow lab named Fetch. Strange name, I'm aware. Those were all of them. The five of us, great friends. The day was a blur. Talking, eating pizza, playing, watching shows, playing those crappy arcade games, kid stuff. But the shit hit the fan pretty soon. A rabbit costume, I think. It had to be a costume. It moved too fluidly, too human. It scared me. It was yellow with fluffy golden fur and green eyes. It had a purple bow tie and matching buttons. It was terrifying. It said that there was a tradition for birthday parties here, that the golden bunny would take the kids to a special birthday room and give them gifts in a private performance. He said he would take us one at a time. The ginger hair boy went first, then the tall one, then the short one, and then her, the honey haired girl. As he led her out, I swear I could hear him whisper, Fetch isn't dead, dear. He's with the others. I'll show you him. Minutes passed. After a while, I grew impatient and went to go investigate. I saw the rabbit come out of a room, moving swiftly to the parts and services room near the stage. I walked up to the door, which he had closed, and knocked gently. I heard nothing. Gripping the handle, I twisted it and pushed it inwards, or so I tried. The door was jammed tight. I pushed as hard as my little six-year-old body could, and finally the door gave way. I caught myself on the slippery tile, the door nearly shutting behind me. Thankfully, there was a bit of light letting me see a little. The floor was slick with something, something dark and warm. I didn't realize it right away. I didn't see the huddled mounds. I didn't see the blood on my hands and the blood splattered in the wall. I only saw him. He was lying simply against the wall, hugging his fox plush close to his blood-stained red shirt. I remember crawling over and shaking him, trying to get a response. I remember the next bit fully. I'll write it as I remember. Hello? Are you awake? Melissa? Yes, you idiot. Why are you asleep? Mel, you shouldn't be here. He had reached to gently touch my face, blood dripping from his mouth. 
I only then saw the red, the wound on his stomach. You're bleeding. Hold on, I could get help. No, you can't. But no, Melissa, I'm a goner. He paused to cough some. He weakly lifted the old fox plush to my shaking hands. Take care of him, will ya? You, shh, it's okay. Find him for me, for us, all right? He was slipping out of consciousness. Please, hang on. He went limp. I wanted to scream. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything but get up and run as fast as I could. I locked myself in the restroom for a few hours. I washed the blood from my clothes and hands, though it stained a little. I stumbled back into the room afterwards. I'm not sure why. The light illuminated the room fully. There was blood splattered on the floor. Streets indicated something being dragged. Signs of a struggle were present. I screamed. The police came soon after, but they couldn't find a thing. No bodies, no weapons, no fingerprints. I cried all day. I didn't answer questions. I clung to my brothers. Before we left, I took his hoodie. I still have it in my closet to this day. I remember seeing his mom before we left. I ran to her and hugged her so tight and sobbed harder than I thought possible. It was strange how I felt better clinging to her rather than my own mother. I told her what happened, about the rabbit leading them away. My question, my dad, about a rabbit suit, but he didn't know a thing. There was no birthday party thrown for kids there. There was no private performance for birthday kids. All of it was a lie. I've been putting it off for years, doing minimal research on who this killer could be, but now I feel as if I should dig deeper. I'll go look for clues and keep you guys updated. Wish me luck. I see a boy whenever somebody dies. I was five when I first met him. I could still remember it. We were driving to the grocery store in a big van. My dad at the wheel and my mom arguing with my older brother over an M-rated video game he wanted to buy. The commotion started to make my little sister cry. I sat in the back seat all by myself trying to ignore it all as I played on my Game Boy, but it was too noisy and hot to focus on it. Finally, I gave up and decided to lie down on the seat, taking a nap before we got to the store. I don't know how long I was out, but when I woke up, I was really hot. Sweat was dripping down my scalp and my mouth felt like sandpaper. Sitting up, I rubbed my head and tried to remember where I was, only to realize that the car was parked near the grocery store entrance. My family, no doubt caught up in their arguments, must have forgotten about me. I wasn't alone in the car though. I realized as I noticed there was a strange figure sitting at the passenger seat, looking forward at the car parked in front of us with their hands behind their head. Who are you? I asked bluntly, and I could see I'd taken them by surprise. The figure jumped up from their seat and turned their head around to look at me. I could see that it was a boy with pale skin and silver hair that reminded me of the characters in my brother's games. To my surprise, he smiled when he saw me. Hey there, little guy. He greeted as if he were one of my relatives before he crawled forward into the middle seats. I didn't think he'd wake up. I backed away as he came closer, which made him laugh as he sat backward in the chair, staring down at me. Come on, there's no need for that. I swear I won't touch you. Being a five-year-old, I wasn't equipped to handle a situation like this, and so I resorted to stating the obvious. This isn't your car, I said. That's true, he replied as his smile seemed to grow wider. Don't worry, kid. I won't be here too long. I'm just waiting. Waiting for what? I asked back but in reply, he just winked at me before lying back down on the seats. It was then that I noticed the smell around him, ashy and stale, like a dying fire. Not wanting to say anything else to the stranger, I moved to the edge of the seat and stared to the store's entrance, waiting for my family to come back. After some time passed, I saw my mom walk out toward the van alone in a hurry. It seemed she had finally noticed I was missing. Hey, I said to the stranger, you need to leave, my mom's coming. Really? he asked as he shot back up to look out the window. To my surprise, he seemed excited about the news. Upon seeing her walking down the lot, he turned to me with an oddly somber look, giving what he'd been acting like just moments before. Well, kid, he said, it's been fun talking to you, but I've got to get to work. Don't hate me too much for this, all right? I was about to ask what he meant 
when a loud noise outside caught my attention. I turned back to the window to see that where my mother had been standing, a car was now in her place. A woman who I assume was the driver was standing next to the driver's side, screaming and sobbing as a crowd of people surround her. I was confused about what was happening until I saw two legs lying in the parking lot, the rest of the body obscured by the parked car. A trail of blood was leaking out from a wound I couldn't see, and as my eyes followed it, I noticed that at the end of the legs were my mother's shoes. I stood frozen for a few seconds as my brain processed the scene, and as tears started to run down my face, I turned around to face the boy. What did you do? I called out in anger, only to freeze when I realized I was now alone in the van. Somehow he had slipped out without me even hearing. Now alone and confused, I had no idea what else to do. So I did what any child would have done, crawled into the middle seats, pulled the door open, and ran to my mother. By the time I had gotten up to her sizable crowd had already formed, and I could hear the wailing of an ambulance in the distance. I tried to shove my way through the onlookers, and as I did, I noticed the dying fire smell again. Looking to the direction of it, I could see a glimpse of silver hair before it disappeared through the group and a new burst of energy coursed through my body. I pushed through the crowd with a strength I didn't think I was capable, shouting all the way. As I got to the edge of the crowd, who were now being pushed back by the store security, I could see the boy walking out towards my mom, who was lying in a heap next to the entrance. Leave her alone, I shouted, and ran forward before any of the guards could stop me. The boy ignored my pleas as he neared my mother's body. When he got close enough to her, he knelt down by her side and raised his hand out to her. I was just about to reach them when I felt a pair of hands grab my waist and lift me up. No, I screeched, kicking and punching at my assailant as they pulled away. I looked over to see that it was my father, who was staring at me with a panicked expression as he marched back toward the crowd. Let me go, I protested. You have to stop him. But it was too late, I realized as I turned my head back. The boy had his hand resting on my mother's face, and he was staring at me with a look of remorse. In an instant, I stopped all my protesting and began to sob into my dad's shoulder. Later, when we were in the police office, we'd been told that my mother died on the scene. In her hurry to come back for me, she wasn't paying attention to the traffic of the parking lot and didn't notice a car pulling through the next lane. The woman was on her phone and didn't notice my mom until it was too late. I tried to tell them about the boy in the car who knelt beside my mother as she was lying on the asphalt. However, everyone told me that I was the only one who had tried to run up to her. They even looked through security footage of the parking lot to see if there was anyone else in the van with me before my mother's death, and they saw that there was nobody else inside but me. Eventually, they had a specialist come in and say that the heat of the van, mixed with the trauma of the experience, had caused me to hallucinate the whole thing. Still, though, for the next few days, whenever we ride in that old van, I smell that dying fire scent lingering in the air. I've been paralyzed for five years. This morning, I woke up with feeling in my legs again. When I was 17 years old, I was in a horrific car accident that claimed the lives of my father and my little brother, Jax. Not only did I lose two of the most important people to me on the same day, but I offered suffered an irreversible spine injury that left me paralyzed from the waist down. I was a very athletic kid, so suddenly being paralyzed was like having something precious ripped away from me. Track was suddenly no longer an option. My friends were still nice to me, but we eventually all drifted apart as I had completely altered my life around my injury. I had to move to the bottom floor of my two-story house, and things that I once did mindlessly took planning and a lot of energy to complete. It took about a year to finally get into a steady rhythm of things and another two to accept that being paralyzed is a part of who I am now. There is no cure for being paralyzed. At least that's what I thought. Last night, I was at a bar with a friend of mine named Frankie. She's a loud and rambunctious girl who likes to drink way too much, but I love her to death. It was around midnight when I first spotted the stranger staring at me from a corner booth at the bar. He had a drink in his hand that he was slowly sipping on. He was handsome, in an almost otherworldly sort of way. His porcelain skin seemed to glow in the dank bar light, and his amber eyes were fixated on me. He looked like an angel. He was rather dressed up for a bar in a button-down shirt and black slacks, but his tie was missing and the first few buttons of his shirt were undone. He looked like a businessman that was just having fun. I haven't been on a single date since being in my wheelchair. There are people that honestly don't care about it, 
but the feeling of being a burden hinders me from going back into the dating scene, so having a gorgeous man openly stare at me was rather unnerving. It took about 10 minutes for Frankie to notice him, and with a sly smile on her face, she subtly found someone to occupy her time, leaving the seat next to me at the table open for someone to claim. It didn't take long for him to take a seat next to me, and as he sat down, I got this feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. He introduced himself as Ray, and we chatted on the weather and what we do for a living. I'm an artist, and he is actually a businessman, as I guessed. It explains the attire. Talking with him was like breathing simple and easy. He never once asked about why I'm in a wheelchair, which is why I agreed to talk with him longer. As he ordered me more and more drinks, I found myself willingly talking about it for the first time since it happened. The question that followed after my story was one that still strikes me as important. What would you do to be able to walk again? It seemed like a harmless question, one that my friends have asked me before. Of course, the answer is always the same. Anything. I would do anything to be able to feel my legs again, to be able to walk and run and reach the cookies that my mother keeps just out of my reach. His tone was the only thing that was different, the thing that made me uneasy. It was almost teasing, his eyes alight with joy as I answered him. In the following hours, I don't know how, but I knew I made a very grave mistake by answering the way I did. The conversation ended rather abruptly after that, with Frankie falling into the table and spilling our drinks everywhere. I called us an Uber for a way home and prayed that she would be okay on her own. As we waited outside, Ray took my hand in his own and delicately planted a kiss on my knuckles, his eyes gleaming in the darkness. I'll be seeing you soon. Those words now haunt me as I stare at myself in the mirror, standing on my legs for the first time in five years. The words weren't a request. It was a statement, a promise. He will be seeing me and I cannot help but wonder if his gift this morning is a threat or an order. What will I do to be able to walk again? I woke up this morning with a deadly looking dagger on my nightstand, and symbols that I've never seen before were carved into the hilt, overlapping one another. There were triangles and circles and swirling patterns that resembles vines. That wasn't the only thing different. I could feel my legs. It wasn't just a gradual warm up to walking. I could stand and jump and run. I'm not sure what I got myself into, but something tells me Ray is not just a normal person. Ever since waking up, I've periodically checked on the dagger, but it hasn't moved from the position on my nightstand. The symbols seem to glow as the night progresses, and I worry what will happen when I see Ray again.